Welcome to the No Name Brand Podcast. My name is Sashka Hanarapal, actress, singer, dancer, turned brand marketing sales and advertising strategist who brands your soul. And each week I bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover your under God. Turn up your leadership notches, challenge the status quo, because you're fast and furious with a powerful message to share with the world. Thank you for taking time out with me today. And without further ado, let's get our creative and wisdom juices for low wall. Buongiorno, my lovelies, and welcome back to the No Name Brand the Podcast with me, Sashka Hanna Rappoli, your host. Folks, thank you for being here with us and sharing your time listening to the world's movers and shakers who are wanting to share with the world their special gifts to help others grow in their awesomeness. And today is no exception. We have a live fairy with us who loves to disrupt the norm. Why? because she has the strong desire and passion to help you carve your own path in life. And the only way to do that is using your innate creativity that gives you special powers to think out of the box and expand within your incredible self. Our next guest is Joy from the inside out, like the movie, because she pretty much feels all. She's kick-ass and enthusiastic about the life, love, creativity, and just learning to be you. So without further ado, how about we delve into the world of creativity, dance, business, and life with the one and only Kat Schulter. Hello there, Kat. Welcome. I hope I pronounced your surname properly. You know what's funny is you probably pronounced it more properly than I do. (laughs) (laughs) It's only because it's like very German or Austrian German, so it's like Schulter. It It is. I think it is actually pronounced Schulte, but here in Canada, we say Schulte. Oh, okay, cool. Schulte. We got put an E. <laughs> yeah, the E <laughs> in the Western. And most people call us a Schulte or a Schultz. <laughs> yeah, because it's Schulte, like a shoulder. If you add an R in the end, it's a shoulder in German. So oh. Like, okay, that's pretty cool. So you shoulder, cat shoulder. <laughs> what? <a> big shoulder <laughs> carrier. Cool, man. Thanks so much for being with us here today. Thank and you. I'm going to dive right in and ask... What does creativity mean to and for you? So why did you choose to focus on this particular area in helping folks? Okay, this is a great question. Creativity is, I believe it's like our divine innate ability to create whatever we want in the world. Like it's tapping into, it's like co-creation. I don't know. Let's get into this a little bit. Let's explore this question. Cool. Because- I, like, I like exploring. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. It's going on the adventure. I'm like, okay. Go, Scott. <laughs> Because how do I want to word this? Like creativity is like your ability to think outside the box. It's your ability to own your gifts. It's your ability to create whatever you want in the world, right? It's your absolute ability to use your mind and your brain and your gifts and everything that you came to this earth for in a way that becomes a tangible output into the world. Does that make sense? (laughs) I love that. I love that. (laughs) Because we're all divine creators. Like we came here to create. And to explore creation and explore our gifts. And so creativity is just the process in doing that. I like that. Because a lot of people associate, well, I'm saying people in inverted commas, they associate creativity with being an artist and totally oh, out yeah. there. Like I'm just not talented enough to be creative. But I love that you oh. said we were born to create. Everybody is creative. Everybody. This is such a huge controversy and I get into discussions about this all the time, right? Because people do associate it with art and artists are creative, but it doesn't mean that they're the only piece of creativity that is being presented unto this world, right? Business people are exceptionally creative. You've taken something that didn't exist and you put it into the world. And I don't care if you've started a finance firm or a medical firm or a dance company. That's a creative endeavor. The way that you treat your family is a creative endeavor. The way that you make a family is a creative endeavor. The way that you design your home is a creative endeavor. And so I want to steal back creativity from just the artists because no artist would ever say that either. They wouldn't say, oh, creativity is only for the artists. And some people think that, right? And the whole debate, are you born with being an artist or creative and or can you explore it? Both. (laughs) Like, why are we putting so many limits on ourselves in this world? We're so dynamic. 
right? Yeah. Why do we put limits on ourselves? Oh, I like we, that. Yeah. I gave um, an impromptu, totally improvised speech in front of like a group of people at a conference that I was with in Florida. So a bunch of people who ranged, right? And they're all business people but ranged from coaching to high level business people to seven to eight to nine figure earners in the room. And there was this one person, cause I was just playing, I was just showing them that we can create speeches or talks cause it was a speakers conference and um, with the JT Fox foundation. And so I was showing them that, yeah, I can do this. We were one of the people that was working with us the day before was showing them how they could do it. And they said, Oh, well, I want to show you again. And I said, I could show them. <laughs> right? This person who's been sitting and learning with them, it's like, I want to show you because this is one of my gifts. <laughs> and I went through this whole thing of this child, right? They, they, they picked a fan on the roof. So I went through the story about this kid who lived on this island of just complete creatives. Everybody was dancing and creating and making and how he just didn't, his mind didn't work like that. He was a tinkerer, but he wasn't creative. He couldn't do that. He was so limited in this and he felt terrible. He kept on saying, I can't do this. That's not me. And so he'd felt so alone in this island of creatives. Everybody was creative, but he liked to just kind of explore. He was an explorer and he knew how to put things together and his mind worked in this analytical way and how he explored this thing and he created this big fan on this hot island in this day. Nobody knew that he could do that, right? So he walked into like his house, rolling this fan that he'd made on the beach. And it was such a hot day that nobody could do anything and nobody could create. And he just flipped this fan and they went, oh my God. And they brought the whole entire village into this thing and they just celebrated his mind. And this one man in the room, it was just so beautiful. I had one friend of mine like just jump up and just like, oh my God, like I didn't know you could do that. But this other man said, you just transformed my life. For him, he was such a brilliant analytical man, like started this, I can't remember his name right now, which is unfortunate, but he started this incredible medical company and put together this system that could scan your body and figure out all these things that were going on. He franchised it into like a seven, eight figure business, but he never felt creative. And so when I looked at him and said, everybody is creative, you put together a business, you are creative. He just was like, he was almost in tears. And I was almost in tears because everybody's creative. And I hate that we've put into the world that creativity is, is for these artists. It's like, no, that's just a one way to explore creativity. But there's so many beautiful ways to explore creativity. And you and everybody is exploring creativity. Definitely. The guy that's created the medical tool, he is an artist. He was just doing it with his mind rather than with his hands. Yes. Yeah. Differently. It first formed with the mind and then with the hands. Well, think about mathematicians, right? That they can actually create things in their mind in mathematical form. That mm -hmm. is genius. That's brilliant. That's creative. Yeah. But that's also complete divine, right? <laughs> that's one way that the divine works with you. You is an actress and a singer. The divine just kind of moves sound and music and voice through your body. And you use your body as an instrument where this person uses their mind and they can figure out these beautiful things that they can tell somebody else to put into the world in a tangible form. I was actually thinking about it the other day about creativity. Actually, while I was preparing for the show, how the younger generation, because they're so attached to technology, a lot of people say that their creativity is limited. And I thought about it and I thought, oh, yes or no, maybe their learning ability is not so expansive or they haven't ex been able to explore it as much visual thinkers or analytical thinkers or auditory yes or it's even heightened because of technology so everything's just moving faster for them than it would for someone that earlier or later generation i don't know i was just thinking about it. I thought, oh yeah i wonder hey they just think that because they're very kinesthetic and they're hearing things, so it's auditory all at the same time. And there's yeah. just like matrix things happening in their mind. I like what you're saying here, because I see it as actually right now, we're going through the kind of terrible thing about it is they're actually going through information overload. And what they're not doing is creating patience to explore it. Because things happen at such a fast rate, right? Whereas, as you know, if you're going to break down a scene or if you're going to sing a song, that takes practice. Yes. And we've also established this world right now that says if you're not instantly amazing, then you're not amazing for some weird reason. Because they look at somebody who's like, oh, they're like instantly amazing. Oh, look, at just by their looks, they're famous. And it's like, well, and especially if you see someone who's beautiful and talented, they go, oh my gosh, like I'm it's so much comparisonitis. And it's like that person person 
practiced. Nobody tells you about the grueling practice that comes. And it's not even grueling. It's joyful practice. Nobody tells you about the joyful practice. Nobody tells you about the times when you're just dancing in your living room, when you're just singing for fun, when you're just practicing sounds in the forest. Like nobody kind of talks about that because it's this weird, because it is your private process. Yeah. And so some people share their process, but even when you share your process, you share it in a way that in which you want people to know about it. You don't talk about the other parts of the process. Process. But all this kind of false information, I think that they're getting so much information at one time, but it's the patience to go, I'm good enough to do this too. And I'm going to practice it. And I'm going to be patient. And I'm going to draw a hand a thousand times so that I can get good at drawing. Or I'm going to see what I can create in my mind. I love it. A few of us actually, my friend, so I've got my company and my friend was Shop and Shout. His name is Vinny, uh, Vinny, uh, Vinod Varma. <laughs> and then my friend Jaron Misi, he has Nude Vodka. We've gotten together here in our high school. We've taken on 15 students and we've called it Startup New West. And we're mentoring them and showing them how to build businesses. And then we're going to um, give them sponsorship at the end to actually start their business. But it's great because I have these two men who are very business analytical, blah, 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 and I'm the whole creative backside and the mentality and the mindset side. So it's great to come together and these kids are just like, wow, this different way of thinking that I knew that I could think like this, but no one's teaching them to, like you said, mm -hmm. critically and creatively think about a process or breathe and say, it's okay. It's a process. It's a practice. And it comes with, am I allowed to swear on your show? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm pretty, yeah. I choose okay. less of it as explicit. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. So I call it the mind fuck, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all go through this mind fuck. We all go through it. Yeah. Hey, so tell me, how did you get into your creative field and what process do you use or have you created for yourself or are aware of? Because often creatives aren't aware of their process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it took me a while when, whilst I was in my business and putting things together where I was like, oh, hang on a moment. I've actually got a, a process that I go through and then teaching that as well. But it's different for everyone. So how did you get into the creative field and what processes do you have? I've had such a beautiful little journey. <laughs> <laughs> So I call myself a creative. So I come from an acting background, yeah. a performing arts background, yeah, <laughs> and a writing background mm -hmm. and uh, film and television and things like that. So that's been my whole entire life. And it's interesting when you pursue something your whole life and go, this isn't really for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. My whole self-identity got kind of like put into a jumble in my 20s going like, because I was so unhappy with that industry and with what we were putting out and what we weren't putting out and all this kind of stuff. And just the way that actors themselves are treated. In Canada, it's challenging. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, it's a challenging industry because everything that comes into here is U.S. based and all our leads are U.S. citizens. So it's challenging because you can't create a career here for the most part. And the people that do, do do well, but you're talking about maybe 10 people. <laughs> maybe. Okay. Anyway, no, it's more than that. Actually, it's called the Vancouver 60. There's like 60 working actors and they probably make anywhere from 100 to 300 grand, but that's out of 25,000 people in wow. <laughs> pursuit. And that's just act. So how I got into this. So I pursued it my whole life. I don't know. From the time I could speak, I was saying I wanted to be an actor. I have no idea where that came from. I asked my mom one time, I said, where did that come from? And she's like, I don't know. <laughs> she wanted to be an actor. Her mom was kind of an actor. Like, so maybe it just came from a curiosity, but I was always a weird person. <laughs> <laughs> be like weird, weird people. Yes. Yeah. And then so when I went into my coaching practice, I actually started with artists teaching process and business, right? Because I went into healthcare and became, had a really great healthcare business for the last decade as well and had clients. I was a massage therapist in Canada. That's, it's a process. It's a four year kind of process to do that. And <laughs> I set up this wonderful business that I loved and then I totally burnt out actually totally burnt out. I was running two production companies. I was trying to be an actor. I was trying to write stuff and had my healthcare business and my body just rejected all of it because I was around a lot of toxic people. I was taking on so much energy. I'm very empathic and I didn't know, right? So all of a sudden, I'll tell you a little bit of my story. So yeah, my, my mom was a single mom of five kids. My dad, he's a homeless addict. <laughs> So he lives on the streets and he's suffered from addiction my whole life. But in 2014, he actually went on the street for the first time, like full on. 
And I saw him that summer and it just rocked my world. My, my father is a messy, beautiful human being. He's highly intelligent, it grew up in a very well-to-do family. Like there was no, I don't know, right? It's one of those unexplainable things. But I think that my aunt was talking about it. She's like, he was exceptionally shy. So drugs brought him out of his shell. And that was, you're looking at the 70s and 80s, right? So you're looking at this time of this kind of exploration of this kind of stuff. And his idols, I think, were doing a lot of that kind of stuff. But instead of, but they had millions of dollars and they died. <laughs> you know, they died in their 20s. That's so true, yeah. So he always saw, it, it always kind of felt, he felt very cool with that. Like, I could see that even as a kid. Like, he was just always this kind of rebel person who felt really cool, plus a highly intelligent guy. He just wanted love. And somehow this brought him love. And then, of course, addiction happened. And he'd been addicted since he was probably 16, 17 years old, oh, right? Wow. Yeah. So he went on the street and there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of love. And then there was a lot of abandonment. Then there's a lot of anger. And then there's a lot of moving through that. And then I went and visited him. I have a little brother who's 10 years younger. And we went and visited him on the street. He had a phone at the time. I went home and just felt like my heart chakra broke open and I couldn't stop sobbing and sobbing and so it changed me it changed me physically it changed me mentally it threw me into massive depression and anxiety and it doesn't mean that that wasn't always kind of lingering there on the surface but it just threw me into this kind of um, disillusionment state of what the fuck right how can this happen this is a beautiful human being I had so much compassion nobody would ask this nobody would want this for the world how can people do that. He was sitting and he was kind of falling asleep on a sidewalk. And my little brother and I were on the other side of the street because we just went and went to look at some shops and he was doing something else. And people were just walking by, walking by, like looking at him weird. And my little brother, who was probably 16 at the time, just turned to me and he said, that's our dad. He said, everybody's just walking by like he's nothing. And that's our dad. And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> It's like holding that for my siblings and for all of us who are just holding this massive love for this person who cannot love themselves. And it was just this heart opener. And so I went on this whole journey and that's when it started like, it's interesting how this happens, right? How the universe pushes you when you're not listening. And so I was in a toxic work environment and I was in its toxic company with partners that weren't treating me very well. And at least I didn't feel. And there was, I was working so hard, so hard, burning out, burning out, burning out, spinning my wheels until I literally broke. My whole right side of my body just completely crashed. I couldn't touch anybody. I was in pain 24 seven and I was in my twenties, remember? So I'm like this broken kind of blah of a human being and I had to quit my life. So within like, I think it was two or three weeks, I called all my clients thousands, sent a huge email just saying, I'm done. I'm sorry. I have to quit this. I canceled my last client and I took eight months off. Like I was blessed because I could somehow do that. I don't even know if I could do that actually at the time, but like, and then slowly crawling out of it, I got some quiet, some peace. I got some beautiful opportunities to stay on this island where this person didn't have a TV or anything. And I was in the middle of the woods and I was taking care of a couple cats. And for the first time I was like, oh my gosh, I have not been quiet in years, years, just massive distraction. And then my sister had handed me this book and I just was like, I want to be a coach. I want to teach artists how to be business people. I want to teach people how to get in touch with their creative side. I want to teach people how to heal and transform as I was transforming my life. So that's a really long story, but that's how I got into this. And then I started taking on clients because artists don't really know the business side. Then you asked me about process. I'm sorry. I can talk all day. My goodness. You want me to talk? I'll talk. <laughs> Join the club. Yeah. I'm very aware of my writing process. I'm very aware of my acting process. Acting is something that I don't do a whole lot of because for me, it's a lot of work like to be an actor. It's just like you have to dedicate yourself to something. And so I dedicate myself to transformational healing and empowerment and coaching because that's what I want to dedicate myself to. That's what really lights me up inside. But my process of writing, and I always tell all my writers to do this. I said, if you want to write something, if you don't have your own process, you have to find your own process. But if you don't have a process, this is the one that I find has worked for writers, especially if you're writing a book or a screenplay or anything. So if it's a book, you get your, say, 10 chapters, right? I want to write my life or a fiction or whatever. These are my 10 chapters. Just put a main thing. And then honestly, like you do a little outline. What is this book kind of going to be about? Cool. Then you set everything aside. You take chapter one and you go, my life, right? And then you just write and you do not edit as you write. 
you write until the book is done. You don't look back. You do not do anything like that. You write until it's done because you don't have a product until you have a first draft. Yeah. And so most people get caught up. This is artists, right? It's a bunch of different half done projects all over the place, right? Oh, I'm writing a kid's book and I'm writing a screenplay and I'm writing a book and I'm writing a biography. And I'm like, great, are any of them done? No, well, you have no <laughs> products. <laughs> Exactly. Right? And that doesn't have to be everybody's process. But I do that for my screenplays. Oh, well, I was doing it when I was writing screenplays. And I, I did that for my books. I've got some books that are going to be coming out. And it's really the only way for me, because if I start reading it, the thing is, is that the first thing that comes out with writing is cliche. First thing that comes out with acting is cliche. You say these lines in a cliche, weird way. You process how you think it should go. And you have to explore how actually it comes out as you as an authentic person. And acting is the art of presence, reacting authentically in the moment. And so me and my husband are both also acting teachers. We're certified Meisner teachers. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Because I mean, the acting and staying authentic, you have to do that same role and that same scene and practicing it 20, 30 times. So if it's a crying role, by the time you're actually crying, it still needs to come across as authentic. Yeah. That's not easy. No. And sometimes like, and, and it's an exploration, right? Mm. So it's beautiful. Like I trained with a, a man named Larry Silverberg and he is an absolute genius. I mean, I've trained with a lot of people. My favorite teachers are Ted Whittle and uh, Larry Silverberg. Ted Whittle is a, he's a beautiful genius academic and a gorgeous actor. And, and Larry Silverberg is from New York. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah. And he trained directly with Sanford Meisner. So wow. he's a fascinating man. And he took what Meisner taught, except for he put massive compassion into it and a process, a different, I don't know if he'd put a different process, but he put his own process and he has the True Acting Institute and it's court. He's a beautiful teacher. So he's my favorite. Yeah. So that's my process. But with coaching, are you asking, did you ask me about my coaching process? Creative. Your creative, my creative process. Yeah. 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 And honestly, for anything else, because I paint, I dance, I'm actually creating a channel dance course right now. A four week question about that. Yeah. Yeah. With healing. Cause I do energy healing and I work with energy healing and I like it with dynamic movement. Mm -hmm. So channel dance is a great way for me to, to explore that. And I wanted to teach it because it's an incredible healing technique. So yeah. So that's kind of my creative process with that is speed of implementation. Mm -hmm. I like this. Let's do this. Is this a topic I can talk on? Do I need to research anything? How do I create this? What do I want to create? And then sometimes it's actually mostly just like, all right, this is the four weeks. It's this. And I kind of go, these are my topics. And then I improvise it. Mm -hmm. Not sort of improvise, but just go with what is coming out with my gut. I love yeah. that. It's you mentioned something just now. Creativity, it also breeds procrastination. I mean, you can have heaps of ideas, heaps, heaps, heaps of ideas. And then overwhelm sets in and then you just procrastinate on starting that idea. So how should we deal with procrastination? How do you get over it? How do you get it sorted out? What do you do with this overwhelm? I think a big thing is that artists don't like to choose, <laughs> right? They get caught up in this thing of what's going to make them money, mm. what people will want to do, see, have, whatever, mm. play with. And that's what kind of breeds procrastination. Also judgment, massive judgment of their work. But I actually learned a great way with kind of discerning this from a coach that I coached with when I first started into my coaching stuff. Her name is Kelly Ruda. Because I'm actually a totally sort of type B. Like I'm an organized person in a very disorganized way, right? Like kind of like crazy. And I've got all these and I have all these ideas, but the ones I take actions on are the ones that I get the most excited about. And when I lose my excitement for them, I continue them because I've made the choice to do it. And so she said, you take all your ideas and you put them into three categories, which is action, Moodle, and shelve, <laughs> right? So action, like, okay, these are the top five or 10 that really excite me. And I want to get these done, right? And then you go Moodle, like these are the ones that aren't quite formed yet. These are the ones that I think are great, but need to be worked on. And so you can either put them on a whiteboard and go like this movie or this book or whatever, or this um, coaching program. Every time you get an idea, you just jot it down um, and then shelve. This doesn't bring me excitement anymore. And I don't want to put my energy into it. Everything is energy. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very discerning where we put our energy. And when you are an exhausted artist or a creative or business person, it's because you've been putting your energy into too many things out of probably fear, fear of missing out or fear that you're not enough or fear you're not worthy and that you need to keep showing up in this one way. 
So I'm very discerning with who I work with now uh, and how many people I work with and uh, the way that I work because now I work exceptionally intensely. So I only take on a couple or a few clients at a time and do deep, energetic, clearing, healing, daily work. <laughs> yeah, so for artists, think about what really excites you and then you commit to finishing it because you do not have a product unless you finish it. Yeah. I'll say this for actors because I have told every single actor to do this. Not one has done it. What? Is it not one. Hundreds of actors. I'm like, this is how you become, in this day and age, I believe this is how you can become a well-known actor or start a career. And it's very simple. And it's very simple. Everything is very simple. You take a scene that you love or you get somebody to write it or whatever, whatever you want to do, you write it yourself and you put something on tape on a weekly basis and put it on YouTube and share it. That's and it. none of them have done it. Not one person. Not no. one person even dabbled or played with it. And I'm just like, because one, their ego gets in the way of like, oh, I don't want to look like I'm just putting something on tape and putting it on YouTube. And I'm like, get over yourself. You put things on tape all the time. Two, they just don't want to do the work because most actors are in it for the weird reason and they don't actually explore creativity within an acting realm. They do their classes and they do the scene breakdown and they do it exactly how, and they half-ass their classes. I was one of them, I know. <laughs> Where you sort of, your ego gets in the way that you just are like, because if you're not great that right away, then you're not worthy. You're never going to make it. You're never going to be picked. You're never going to be the prettiest, the greatest, or the this, this, right? So I say, put something on tape, get excited about it, work and put something great. Don't put out crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Work it into Good great. scenes. And you won't be denied. You will not be denied. And it gives your agent an ammunition. You don't think this girl's good? Here's this, here's that. You don't think that guy's good? Here's this scene, here's that scene. She has loads now to, to show, right? Oh, you want a comedy? Here's a couple that my client did now. And that will actually, you cannot be denied if you're great. But believe me, nobody knows you're great because nobody sees you. Exactly. That's the whole thing. It's also a lot of people with, it's actually quite interesting, irrespective of what vocation you have, there's always a thing of whether it's entrepreneurship or the acting or the singing or the dancing or the medical, whatever. We all have an element of wanting to please. Yes. And wanting to please comes in with a lot of other things that hang on to it, which is I don't feel good enough, I don't feel strong enough, I don't feel pretty enough, clever enough, all those things that hang on to you. And these things hold you back and limits then your creativity. And now in entrepreneurship, and I can really understand the acting or the whatever, the entrepreneurship, because I work in the world of branding and marketing yeah. and the whole entertainment and in order to stand out, the illusion at first that it's all visual, that that visual part is part of your soul. So if your soul isn't showing, then you're not going to stand out. But if it's just visual because it looks pretty or you're just acting or putting something out there so it looks good, I believe in faking it to making it, but if it just looks good, then there's, there's not you in it. So in today, what do you think, like in today's small business entrepreneurship, creativity is asked for more than ever to stand out, but to bring in who you are. Yeah. Cause I mean, my very like typical business friends, right. They don't see the world the same way that I do, right. <laughs> they see massive competition and trying to do this and trying to do that. I think that in entrepreneurship, especially small business, your creativity is going to cancel out any kind of competition because everything is energy. What you put out, you attract back, right? What you put out is also felt. If you put out something that you're really scared or if you put it out going like, oh man, nobody's going to buy this. Why would anybody buy this? Is, and it's actually a beautiful, brilliant product. People are going to feel mm -hmm. that. So it's getting creative also with your energy with yeah. what your intention is to put out. And it comes back also to that patience, that alone time, that searching for what do I really want to put into this world, right? And exploring that. Does that make sense? Like, yes. Yeah, so creativity is in incredible because, and this is why, because we have 7 billion people. All of us want to buy stuff, but nobody wants to be sold to anymore. Yeah. And so your specific energy, and the nice thing is that in this online world, like yourself, right? You can't handle a million clients, yes. but if you have like a thousand true fans, mm. right? That thousand true fan, I forget who said that, you have clients for life. And so everybody's trying to get all these things. It's like, no, we don't want 
no offense, but the Walmarts and the Kmarts and the big giant corporations anymore. Nobody wants that because everybody's being treated like shit in that world. These small businesses are actually an opportunity to grow something and have a great living and prosperous for everybody. But also now you don't have to be the giantest and only branding and marketing person in the world. Everybody can have their thing, but people are going to resonate with you and come to you because of what you're putting into the world and go, oh my God, like Sashka is her branding, her marketing is, is exactly what I want. Whereas somebody else is going to go to somebody else because that's going to really, but if they want something creative and energetic and alive, like, I love that you said that it's not about being pretty and lovely. Like, yeah, you want it to be, you know, you don't want it to be not visually pleasing, but what's the energy behind it? What part of your soul? People ask me about branding and marketing all the time, my clients, and I go, you should work with a branding and marketing person. <laughs> but this is my basic thing is if you can't especially afford somebody at the time, it's like, what are your favorite colors and what do you love? <laughs> Yeah. Right. So like for me, like um, my whole entire branding is built on amethyst and emerald Ooh. colors. And I love fairies. So my, my logo is a fairy sitting on the edge of a box, looking inside the box, right? Because it's like, think outside the box. Think about this creativity. The original fairy was drawn by my best friend. She did that for me. And then put together by another friend of mine who built a logo. And then when I got all my branding done by this beautiful woman named Rosanna Gilio, who's a genius as well, she put everything together in this girlier way than I would have maybe wanted. But then I'm like, I really like this. Oh my gosh. Because there's all these vines. Because vines are something big. So, you know, it's putting together everything that you love. Because like you said, it's a piece of your soul. Mm. Here, it's just the kind of stuff that I love. And you're going to feel it because I get really excited when I put a little vine under my like quotes, like, Ooh. <laughs> right. And I'm kind of really not great like that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so creativity is often seen or it's seen as limitless, completely like there's an, it's never ending. Yes. And yet we hold ourselves back and we don't feel that limitlessness and say yes to things that you want and need to spur on with creativity. How do you think we can spur that on? <laughs> um, <laughs> everything to me is deep self-exploration mm. digging into this right because that limit that you feel is the limits that you're putting on yourself yeah right it's that time that you sewed your teacher a painting and they went oh that's okay but that was that looks weird you tried to do something and someone said oh you're not a very good artist don't quit your day job <laughs> right and oh my gosh you pick up a guitar once and someone goes ah that's terrible and you're like oh i'm terrible i can never play the guitar right <laughs> like it's like okay. it's insane but you know what this is all about exploring your curiosity sorry get really curious about what you're curious about i recommended the book big magic right and that's one thing that elizabeth gilbert says is like get really curious and i'm so all about that right so i just get really i get really curious about for me, it's all about like the spirit world <laughs> and how to dive deep into yourself and how to look and explore that. And if I'm not creative, a lot of my world gets really ang anxiety ridden. Yeah. So I have to tap out. And sometimes that comes out in paintings. I paint. I can like, I'm not like, hey, yeah, I'm a great painter. But I'm a no, never. <laughs> Never, ever, ever. But I just sometimes I'm just like, just the feeling of a paintbrush and slathering paint. Like I made this terrible painting the other day. <laughs> it was, but it was so much fun for me, right? Like, I'm just like, I don't care. Like I'm just wiping purples and greens everywhere, right? And that's like, and flow and things like that. I tell almost everybody to dance. Like just, just feel your body move curious. Let yourself download these things. Let yourself ask a question and know that you don't know the answer and see what comes through you, mm. right? Like, let yourself not be perfect. Let yourself not know everything. Let yourself be curious about trying to see what comes out. Let yourself explore these off-the-chart thoughts, right? Because those are often the thing I listen to a lot of Abraham Hicks and in the spiritual world, I think that a lot of us do. But you know, her little thing is like, I meditated. And then I came out of meditation and was like, I just want to move all my furniture around for no good reason. And then she did. And she hired a couple or she was playing with like, then she's like, Oh, I want to play with my sound system. And then rap came on and she's like, I like rap. <laughs> and then she's like, Oh, I want to move my furniture around. And then this like guy, a couple guys came over to help her move all the furniture around. And then she's like, Oh, what do you do? And the guy said, Oh, I'm a rapper. <laughs> right? Oh my God. No, what this thing is going to, and I wish I had my own great I mean, I do, I have my own great things about this, but even 
like even for a client of mine, one of my clients is a screenwriter. And like for me, I just got into this thing of, cur- I get curious about human beings. Mm-hmm. So I have coffee dates with people and I reach out to almost anybody. And I'm just like, I think you're cool. You want to go get coffee if you're in my area, right? So I met so many people that way. And so I met this wonderful director named Jason Burr. And he's been doing some incredible stuff in Canada. Like you look at some of the millionaires in the U.S. who I've directed and created 11 movies. Like Jason Burke has done over 20. And he's obviously not a millionaire. Well, he might be a millionaire. I have no idea. But he's getting, he's making headway. He just did a movie called Drone with Sean Bean. Oh, wow. And I'm like, he'll be the first Canadian to win an Oscar, I hope right? But nobody knows his name. That's the crazy part about Canada, right? You can be a genius. Nobody will know your name. Anyway. So I just reached out to him one day and said, Hey, want to grab coffee. So we grabbed coffee. And then years later, I had this client, like maybe not years, but yeah, probably a year or two later. And this client, I said, Oh, you know, you should start submitting to the local directors. And Jason Burke's a great local director. And so he was like, okay, starts doing all this kind of stuff. And this client who went from never having sold a script, signed a $30,000 contract in the first three months of working with me, that never went to production. But then I introduced him to Jason Burr. And uh, later on the eclipse, there was that eclipse over um, Oregon. So he was coming back from the eclipse. And Jason called him up and said, hey, you want to go to Qatar for four months? Oh my <laughs> so he God. got like a huge writing contract in Qatar and was just chilling out there. So he just got back in December. And like these things, that's a beautiful one where it's just like, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to lead. And I don't know if it's going to take days or months or years. It's like that um, movie with Jim Carrey. Was it with Jim Carrey where you have to say yes to everything? Yes. Yes, man. <laughs> Yes, man. And then you don't know where it's going to go. Yeah, same. And I love how he's evolved as well. Yes. Hey, Kat, we are running out of time. I'm so I sorry. Could, no, but I could talk. We Well, we could talk forever. I haven't gone through a quarter of my questions that I've been wanting to ask you. Bloody hell. So <laughs> we can do a rapid fire if you want right now. <laughs> and I could just do like one sentence answers. <laughs> oh, cool. Hey, so at the end, I ask all my guests two questions. And to get your take on it. And okay. the first one being, so how do you want to change or challenge the world doing what you do? It's so funny because I'm starting this interview thing. In fact, I would love you on it. Oh, called cool. The Disruptors. I'm writing for a global magazine. It'll be announced this week called Manila Up. They have a 300,000 person reach and they're growing and they just created a TV show. And so I said, I want to do this to call them The Disruptors, but I want to do this interview series. And so I want people to start thinking about how they want to disrupt the status quo and not in like a shitty way. Like, you know, <laughs> goosebumps, <laughs> people on goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like not in a crappy way, but how do you personally just not want, like, what don't you like about it? And how can you detach from it? And what kind of messages can you put out there that are complete and utter truths? Like you are a creator and you're limitless, like things like that. So that's how I kind of, I never want to fit into this thing. And I want to keep on pushing myself, try all these different things and grow in this world and challenge these things, right? Like that you're at your income level or that you can't do this or that you can't do that. Or you need to know these people in order for you to get these opportunities. I just want to challenge all that for myself, but I want to also challenge people to think about how they want to challenge this thing. Like, because so many people are unhappy and it's really unfortunate because I run across more people that are unhappy than joyful. They're so stuck in this crap job and it's not ever the job, it's the people that are treating them like crap in the job and they don't see any way out of it. And for someone who's, I've almost never had a job in my life. I've always worked for myself. I I own my own company by the time I was 20. And that's just because I never fit into that. Like, I don't like micromanagement. I don't believe in it. And I don't believe in one way of doing things. So there's so many, yeah, exploring the disruptive nature. Like this, this show for, to me, is like so disruptive. You're, the way that you talk about marketing and branding, that's so disruptive, right? Like, hey, this is your soul. What do you want your, like, you're putting your soul out there. Do you want your soul to just be like lifeless? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like if you're not there, is which is going to be a blob? Like what yeah, exactly. you refer to, oh, there's, there's the blob that gets consistent across everything. I'm a person <laughs> and I do things. Medical people can also be exciting and fun. It really doesn't have to be the norm 
in inverted commas. You don't have to be boring. Yeah. And honestly, you can also work in a, a normal nine to five, but what do you do outside of that that really challenges your status quo? I have one person that is, her name's Stacey McLaughlin, and she doesn't have like a, she's editor of Vancouver Magazine and um, I believe like Western Living Magazine. But on the weekends and this and nights, she is an improviser and has an improvisation team and she dabbled in stand-up comedy. And I'm like, yes, right? Like, so she talks about how to have a creative life outside of your normal life and how to play, right? And like Nick Offerman talks about that in his book where it's like, yeah, this is my friend. He's an accountant. He loves that. But he also makes beautiful wood art on the weekend, like in glass blowing and all of that kind of stuff. If you change yourself, you will change the world. When I started healing myself, my whole family started changing and healing. It's such a profound energy. And also like to push people to go, we can have the world that we want. Let's not continue to be in this dark thing where we can never have the world. We can. We can have the exact world that we want. We can have this beautiful thing where everybody's treated well because we have every opportunity and everything that we need to create that. But every single person has to say, I am ready for it. I'm done with this. I'm done with suffering. I don't need to suffer anymore. And then we can just shift and, and live harmoniously. And I wish that could happen now. And I don't know, I'm not, you know, there's geniuses who know how to make that happen though. I'm not one of them. I just know how to say, you should do what you love. <laughs> I come from a family of disruptors and I like it. My grandfather is actually responsible for the first female RCMP officers, which is our like women in police force in Canada. And I'm just like, that's great. My obachin is just like, you know, this, I'm quarter Japanese. So my obachin is just like this little spicy Japanese lady who's just so feisty and, and beautiful, has the most gorgeous faith. My aunt is a disruptor. She's such a hardcore feminist and and really loves human rights and things like that. So yeah, so that's my series. And it's going to be all about your truth, right? So my truth is that we are limitless and we are gorgeous creators and that we're limiting ourselves. And the way that we're limiting ourselves is through our own belief systems. And so if you can ask a question and be patient to have a co-creation of these weird, crazy ideas, those are the spirit world or your guides or your higher self, however you want to look at it, God, universe, speaking to you going, try this. I want people to explore that. Yeah. Is that good? <laughs> 100, but love it. I love exploring that. And actually, that's what I'm doing every day as well. So that's pretty yes. cool. Beautiful. So three words and your take on it. So creativity <laughs> for you is? Oh, yeah. And dynamic exploration. Oh, there we have exploring it. Wisdom for you is? Inner knowing. Passion for you is? Passion is the energy of action. And action we've had enough on today. Well, not enough. We could actually definitely have some more. So we'll have you on the show again because it's so exciting. And thank you so much for being with us here today. It's been really thank awesome you. getting to know you, getting to know another disruptor. Love disruption. Like you said, like without being weird about it, but just yeah. challenging, challenging the status quo. Yeah. And you can find out more about Kat in the show notes. You can find where she is online, her favorite book, her favorite quote. And if you have any questions or how to get in contact with her, please do. If this has resonated with you, give us a, a drop us a line at podcast at brandsashka.com. We'd love to hear from you and get your feedback. And you can also leave a review on iTunes or wherever. And we're also on Spotify. Woohoo! So thank you so much for being with us today, Kat. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. This has been phenomenal. And I love meeting another disruptor. Yes. <laughs> Take care, everyone. And thank you for being here. Speak to you soon next week. Bye-bye. Dang, that was just super califragilistic expialidocious. I enjoyed having you on board and please do me and you a favor. Head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud or Stitcher. Click subscribe and a super bonus. Leave your review and you stand a chance of being announced and advertised on the show. I'm always striving to ensure that your brand is uplifted and empowered. Remember, done is better than perfect. So be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and send in your feedback too. You're the absolute best. Keep rocking.